Ladies and gentlemen, my name is William Cho, and welcome to Primetime League. We have an awesome show ahead of you. So the big question is, are you ready to listen to the biggest surprises from IEM Katowice? Of course, get to know the LCS playoff picture, buff your fantasy points, listen in on a nice discussion with Pastry Time, hear about the Penta, and of course, last but not least, get that last hit. So prepare yourself because it's Prime Time Lee! And what an what? offer! Oh, throwing everyone into the wall there! The world's best team is beaten by China's worst. Team Solo Bin and the Intel XP Masters World Champions! Hello and welcome to Primetime League, the show that farms your League of Legends pro knowledge to the next level. I am Rivington Beardless III, and doing with me in this lane is Joshua Jatliesman. I don't know what to say to you, Riff. <laughs> you have no face anymore. It is completely different. I mean, after most of the leagues, MPTL got a week off for IAM. Few changes were made, and everyone is back in action, ready for the playoff push. That means we have a lot to cover today. Let's get to it, Riv. Let's get right to it. We're going to go starting things off with the semifinal action from the IAM Championship in Katowice. You were probably watching. First up, the tournament favorites, Korea's undefeated GE Tigers, took on China's last place squad, Team WE. And nearly everyone thought the Tigers would dominate, right? But spoiler alert, this turned into one of the biggest upsets in competitive League of Legends history. I mean, coming into the semifinals, not many people even expected Team WE to make it this far, so it seemed like a formality that the number one team from the historically dominant region right. would just crush this game. Early game wasn't that one-sided, but the mid game definitely was. GE Tigers coming in strong under this turret. Things were looking just like another day at work for GE Tigers. The game was quite close throughout, but they had the control. They used the spikes, the double AD comp correctly, and WE couldn't hold in the first game. This game from the GE Tigers was very similar to the way they win in Korea. They controlled the mid game with really good team fighting and vision control, as well as just overall smart play. Smeb taking every bit of damage that he can without yep. dying. Ace under the turret. It looked like GE Tigers in full control. Full control, just around 40 minutes for the first game and on to game two where everybody pretty much expected the same, but WE was ready to fight back. Everybody kill Smeb. He'd actually <laughs> died once, teleported the bot lane, died again, and then GE Tigers went for the dragon when they didn't actually have the power to do so. Look at how everyone is low at the start of this fight. WE gets to play cleanup. A great steal coming in on the dragon, and then they're just able to clean up. Mystic getting three of the four kills off the follow up here. This was just a feast for WE. Yeah, Mystic on the Ezreal mm -hmm. from the bottom lane, not the mid lane Ezreal that you would normally expect. That's true. But everyone is able to just chase on a Lucas Scion. Absolutely huge. He started that fight, and by God, did he end that fight as well, even though Kuro was able to pick up a kill on the backside. Like Kuro was actually playing that Ezreal last game, so a good takeaway <laughs> there for WE. Aluka diving through on Scion. Doesn't hit anybody, but GE can not fight back. Sometimes it's about sending a message, and this <laughs> message was WE is 15,000 gold ahead and ready to take this one to a game three. We always say, how much would it hurt to be hit in the face with an amount of gold? With 15,000 15, gold. Thousand gold would probably sting pretty bad. Yeah, it's gonna set you back coming into game three as well. I mean, that game two was more dominating by WE than GE Tigers game one was, which actually sets up kind of a crazy game three, and GE Tigers does not start off well. And a crazy charm as well to come in there. How did he fit that through everything? I'm not sure. And that I'll actually snowballed the early game to a 6,000 gold. The GE Tigers trying desperately to contest this dragon. Spirit with a great initiation, great follow-up and choices throughout this fight as the team is scattering. She a charming the LeBlanc, the, the clone. It's okay though, they still come up big on this fight. One of the reasons this fight was so close is that dragon was beating on WE that entire yep. time, which gave GE Tigers a very small window to try and come back. But Shia versus oh, Kuro. Woo! Ball beats person. Ball. The block <laughs> ran right into that spirit orb. And that just meant another giant gold lead and another early game top lane turret died by WE to try and close out this series. Another a giant Aluka, if you will, going into the fight, staving off two by himself. And WE do the impossible. Yeah, but the way in which they won games two and three seemed even more improbable because they made GE look like the team that didn't belong there. That's right, but more games at Katowice to highlight. Team Solo mid versus the Yoey Flash Wolves. 
Another game people thought Team Solo Mid would kind of just kind of sweep this one out. Yeah, most people actually thought Team Solo Mid was going to be in a showdown against SK Gaming. That's but true. The game earlier in the morning had Yoey Flash Wolves there, which TSM actually said affected their preparation pretty harshly. They decided to focus stake in this one and deny him the entire game, but they go a little bit too hard here. A little too hard. Three kills down, now making it four with a cleanup one there. Maybe feeling a little bit pressure to keep going in. I think the story of this game was TSM trying to kill stake a little bit too much, but not having that successfully keep him down. I mean, look at this. Considering all the focus, the fact that he could almost kill Bjergsen by himself forces a teleport from Dyrus. Yep. A missile over the wall from Wild Turtle there. Guys, it's 30 minutes into the game. You're on the bottom side of the map. You're going to lose Baron. He would have gotten away if that missile did not hit. Stake doing the old, what you would say, hot shot play on the bottom lane. Just calling all the resources in. The rest of the team gets it. Yep. Santorin tried Trying a desperation to go for dragon, dragon yep. steal. But it was five dragons against now only four people, which meant a game one victory for the number one team in the LMS, Yoey Flash Wolves. It looks grim. Everybody was thinking, what happened? Is TSM kind of faltering here against international teams once again? But game two, Bjergsen, he decided to take things in his own hands. This was such a ridiculous play. He's low. What? 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 Where'd he go? Oh, oh he's going to be out of range if come he back? goes back. Yeah, right? he's going to come back. What? Oh, my. I don't get it. Completely outplaying right there. And games in which Bjergsen gets a solo kill on the enemy mid laner, you're hard pressed to find that in the TSM loss column. He becomes a global presence immediately. The whole team starts to benefit as soon as he kills his lane once. And then he just roams. You can see the pressure. That game went out pretty quick. 45 minutes, he was 10, 2, and 4. Very tension-filled game because it took 45 minutes for TSM to finish, but they had that gold lead throughout, setting up this game three. Well, TSM finding their oh, groove, man. trying to make quick work of each lane here. Santorin having to play hero there in the top. Pretty tough lane for Dyrus, but Santorin was able to come in again and again at just the right moments here. Gets the Lulu Walt, Santorin in the middle of the fight, allowing Bjergsen to roam around the sides of this one. Watches the Blanc play here. So far out, Boom. finishes right back in to finish off Stake Scion. And he says, let's keep going. Been making plays all day. We're gonna go onto the turret. He missed one there, just a little bit. But it's only the kill. The only kill. I mean, that made it seven kills death, to one. Fast forward, it's 13 kills to one. That was the only yeah. death TSM actually had the entire game was when Bjergsen went a little bit too far. TSM grew in strength as this series went on. Game one, they lose. Game two is close. Game three was a slaughter. Absolutely. So strongly played by Team Solo Mid coming in. Even 10 minutes shorter than the previous game. And the entire team playing very good. Dyrus happy to lock in a win for the fans and bring us to our final matchup, Team Solo Mid versus WE. Are we sure this is the final? Where are the Korean teams? I'm not, this, is this the wrong tournament? Riv? GE Tigers and CJ Entis, that was supposed to be the finals of this. Not in this one, there were upsets all over the place. Who would have thought? The question was gonna be whether WE could continue their run through this tournament. How good was the 11th slash 12th seed in China coming into IM Katowice? Well, early on, Bjergsen gets himself in a bit of trouble. Yeah, he tried to continuously go for the solo kills, bring them in from the other game consistently, but he gets himself in a bit of trouble and Spirit was all over the place causing trouble for Team Solo Mid. Yeah, but TSM, as they always do, sticks around. They're just able to make the mm -hmm. gold lead, never get completely out of control, picking up a kill here, a kill there and Team W was hoping to take the game home, but Shia makes a mistake, gets caught on Ari. A big mistake, 7,000 gold down, TSM put their foot down, and they hold the base strong here. Something we see quite a bit in the NALCS from them. And something Team Solo Mid noticed about this Team WE team composition was with Ari as the mid laner, Sion as the top laner, and Ezreal as the AD carry damage threat. If you shut down that Ari, you shut down the entire yep. team's damage. And it gives TSM freedom to maneuver themselves around this fight because they do not let Shia's Ari get in there. Not at all. TSM know they have TNWE on the ropes and they keep pushing back harder and harder. Another good follow-up flash done from Lost Boy just continues this one. And even with the chase alts being down, they still find a way to get back on a few more members. Look at that chase. Dyrus flashing for the max range harpoon. Yep. And TSM comes back, 7,000 gold down. WE was hoping to continue that win lane, win game strategy, but TSM had the game in mind. 
the game in mind and 3-2 here as we come into the second game with a bit of focus on Dyrus in the top lane, but he's been to this dance before. He knows what to do. Just a little bit. Operation Kill Dyrus was in full effect, but that's because Dyrus was unrelenting with his farming. Even mm. after all these deaths, you can see he's 20 CS up, which keeps the gold kind of close because TSM was taking objectives and a few kills around the rest of the map. So Bjergsen, as usual, if he gets going, TSM does pretty well. Really great to use Dyrus. He doesn't get down. He knows this show, and they keep playing strong. And here, making a very strong teleport and being the first one to do it, something that's plagued him in the past. Yeah, a rare misplay by Spirit, who had played so immaculately the whole tournament, alting on the rec side when they didn't have an immediate numbers advantage, yeah. really opens up the collapse. There's no cataclysm now to stop TSM from running through these jungle corridors, and they just destroy WE in that jungle fight. They somehow lose no one here. Two for zero, nicely picked up, blow a few flashes on that one. And when WE thinks they have a pick, the mobility of Team Solo mid, look at them just come from everywhere, they collapse. Yeah, Lust Boy from one side, Bjergsen from the other, and Wild Turtle doesn't even die Ugh. after getting jumped on at the start. A triple kill from Bjergsen pretty much almost always seals the game. 14,000 gold up, they're knocking at the gate of WE's base. A go for broke fight that Team Solo mid welcomes with open arms. They take WE in gladly and clean those few up right past the turret, and this was the story of this game. All those flash forwards, there is no escape for Mystic's Caitlyn right there. Team WE went really all in with that Caitlyn, trying to win all the lanes that game. It didn't work, setting up a game three. We've seen stranger things, 2-0 <laughs> turning into a 3-2, but this one, Lust Boy with the bait at the start. Oh! Stays alive with the chug of the potion, getting the first kill there for Sant Torn, and a bit of an oopsie here, but you can see the lead that TSM had because they still pulled this fight out. Yeah, 28,000 to under 20,000 at the start of this, mm -hmm. this early in the game. Yes, Bjergsen falls, but the rest of TSM was so huge that they end up turning this into a fight win anyways. Dyrus TP's in from the back. This was all but done at this point. TSM just has to wait until they're actually <laughs> strong enough to take down the Nexus turrets. Note to self, Sweeper doesn't reveal people, I guess. <laughs> yeah. One last go for broke fight again here from WE and TSM is able to just assess the fight cleanly and make it work in their favor. Almost 20,000 gold up at this time. TSM throughout IM Katowice became stronger and stronger as the best of series went on. This was probably their strongest game of them all and it gave them the championship. Look at that, just about 27 minutes on the clock. Holding the trophy tall, TSM takes the crown. So while we're talking about the IAM champions, let's head across the set where the ultimate hype man and host of the IAM championship is waiting to talk about last weekend's games. What's up, Trober? Super excited to be here and can't wait to talk about those games from IAM. Yeah, I mean, most importantly, TSM won the finals 3-0. So TSM, best team world? Uh, you know, well, some people might want to say that. I think we do have to hold off on that entire yeah. judgment for now. Uh, but they definitely came very prepared. Uh, I think really what this says is we can't make any assumptions about regional play anymore. We do have to wait until these global tournaments uh, to find out. Yeah, and not to belittle Team WE at all, but they were the ones to defeat the GE Tigers. Nobody expected that. They weren't even the yeah. team that won the tournament. And honestly, the big story was the fact the GE Tigers didn't win. What do you think contributed to their collapse in the semifinals? You know, I do think, I don't mean this as an excuse for uh, the GE Tigers, but I think they came a little bit underprepared. Uh, I think they okay. underestimated WE I don't, for sure. I mean, TSM didn't expect to play the Yoe Flash Wolves. That's Probably true. the same scenario for the GE Tigers. They weren't expecting to play WE. And I think also WE coming in with those subs, they played their part really well, which threw off the GE Tigers. And what shows is that all right, the G Tigers probably need a little bit more practice adapting mid-tournament because for now they're only playing against the LCK teams and all these players have had experience against the other players in the LCK. So that probably helps them a little bit for now in the Korean region. Yeah, I and mean, people always forget the G Tigers just formed as a team at the exactly. start of the LCK split, so they're still a young team. Uh, Bjergsen was actually voted MVP of IEM, but there's some other big players that stepped up that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I really want to give a big shout out to Lustboy. I think his super plays uh, in the semis and even in the group stages really brought them to the finals. Whereas, of course, Bjergsen, a huge highlight of that team uh, at IEM. On the flip side, also Santorin in the jungle. I think he was such a solid anchor for TSM throughout this entire tournament. I mean, people are looking at his KDA afterwards and just being blown away at how stable he was, allowing people like Bjergsen and Lustboy, of course, the other members, to shine uh, as they carry through for the trophy at IEM.
Yeah, really high pressure situation. A lot of players stepped up huge. Chobra, you also stepped up huge. You did a fantastic <laughs> job hosting I Am Katowice. Again, thanks for taking the time to talk to us, and we'll see you next week as well. Thank you, absolutely. See you guys next week. Yeah, now let's head back over to the desk to take another take on the I Am World Championship. All right, and now I'd like to welcome my main Dane and the man who mentored Bjergsen into the North American I Am Champion he is today. How's it going, Deficio? <laughs> It's going great, Riff. I'm happy to be back on PTL and had a pretty sick IM event. It seemed like it. You also had a front row seat for all the IM action. What were your thoughts looking back on the tournament now? Well, I think it's safe to say it was a tournament of upsets. Nobody could really predict the results. And G Tigers losing to World Elite is one of the biggest upsets ever. And, well, I guess we can say an even bigger upset is that SK Gambit didn't win everything like everyone expected. But, of course, Team Solomate, they look great in the final. It was sadly never really close. NA Pride and all that stuff. <laughs> well, talking about the European teams, I want to know what, how you thought they fared. I promise I won't say NA over EU. Well, I mean, SK Gaming and, and Gambit, their strategies or, or lack of strategies, I think we can say got fairly easily exploited at Intel Extreme Masters. There's still two fairly new lineups who are still a work in progress, in my opinion. So hopefully this experience here should highlight some of the mistakes and they can now fix them coming into the playoffs here in Europe. They have lost a bit of practice on the patch 5.5 due to IEM. So we have to see how they perform this week when we play in the new patch. All right, and I'd like to give you more time to grieve over Europe's performance at IEM, but we do need to look ahead at the EU LCS playoff picture as we head into the final two weeks of the spring split. It's kind of crazy. How do you think things are shaping up? Well, Riff, uh, even with only four games remaining for each team, there's still a lot of things that can happen. Right now, SK Gaming, they sit at number one, and they have a fairly easy schedule, honestly, with teams like Giants and Medium Makers, so they should be able to secure a top two spot, unless, of course, they have problems adapting to this new patch. Fnatic and H2K, they're close together, and it will be very interesting to see who can really get this top two spot and, and follow the race between these teams. And of course, despite Gambit's poor performance at IEM, they still have a playoff spot here in Europe, and they only need to win two out of four games to secure it. All right, while well, the top of the table looks secure, I'd like to focus on the teams battling to make it into playoffs right now. Just one game behind Gambit in the standings is your old squad, the Copenhagen Wolves. They're locked in, in with an epic fight with the Unicorns of Love for fifth place. What are the chances for these two teams to earn a spot? Well, Riff, both of them would need to win three out of four, three out, three out of the four remaining games. And if you look at their upcoming opponents, uh, the Wolves have an easier schedule overall with Rocket and Giants here in week nine. This week, however, is the important one, as beating Unicorns of Love should create some distance to the teams outside of the playoff spots. The Unicorns, on the other hand, they have a much more difficult road ahead of them. They will be up against Wolves, Fnatic, Gambit, and H2K. Three out of these four are among the top teams here in Europe, but that hasn't always been a bad thing in the past for the Unicorns cons as they for some reason tend to upset the higher ranked teams and then randomly lose to the bottom teams in the league. All right well let's shift our focus to two teams that haven't lived up to their preseason hype. Elements and Rocket. They've not only underperformed but they are at risk of fighting to retain their LCS lives in the promotion tournament. What do you think of this? Yeah well both these teams have struggled for the entire split and the next two weeks are going to be really tough for them. Just to qualify for the playoffs Elements they need to win all four games. And they also need the Wolves and Unicorns to lose three games. Not an easy feat when you consider Elements has a losing record against every single team they will be facing. And also just as a side note, the team have now signed both Taps and Dexter as subs. So we might even see them jump into the lineup here sometime soon. Now Rocket, they're in the exact same situation. They have to win four games and the Wolves or the Unicorns have to lose three. But Rocket definitely has an easier schedule in front of them. So I guess the too long didn't read is I expect that one of these teams will barely manage to finish as number seven and hang on to the LCS spot while the other team most likely will, will head down to the promotion tournament. All right, so while Elements and Rocket haven't lived up to the hype, one team that has outperformed expectations is H2K. I gotta ask you, Deficio, are they the best team in Europe right now? Well, the thing is, Riff, when people mention Europe, they talk about Fnatic, talk about SK, talk about Shocks, by far overused memes, and finally Reddit coaching elements. But honestly, that needs to stop right now because H2K is the team we should be talking about. They are so good. So to answer your question, yes, they are currently the best team in Europe, if you ask me. The team has the highest KDA, the highest goal per minute across the entire LCS over the last eight games. And they've just played a game by the book. They went through smart rotations, good roams, and great knowledge of power spikes. And also just one player I want to highlight is, of course, 
Kasing here, the undefeated guy from H2K. He has the highest KDA for support in the entire LCS, both EU and NA, and the second highest KDA overall, just behind God Given on SK Gaming. Everything, everything just seemed to click once he joined H2K, and right now he's chasing Yellowstar for the title of best support in Europe. Man, those NA coaches. So Kasing and H2K <laughs> have won eight games in a row now, which means they could actually break Fnatic's nine-game winning streak this weekend. Do you think they can do it? I mean, if you look at their remaining schedule, they have Elements and Meteor Makers this week, so yeah, I think they can do it. Last week they have Fnatic and Unicorns of Love, so I wouldn't even be surprised to see them win every single game and simply guarantee themselves a first round bye in the playoffs. Awesome. All right, thanks, Deficio. Always great to have you here and motivated despite everyone having their shirt on. We'll see you tomorrow. Well, Rave, you know, I would love to see you without a shirt on, especially with that new, uh, well, I can say lack of beard for you. You look beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Deficio. Well, now let's do a little League of Learning with Jat in the Jungle as he takes us through some of the tanky changes that the 5.5 patch will bring when it hits the LCS this week. Welcome back to the League of Learning, everyone. Last time, we looked at double AD carry compositions, and now with the 5.5 patch entering the LCS, it's time to look at the jungle. There's the current jungle champions and maybe some tank junglers. These are the guys we've seen all year. These are the guys we might be seeing in the future. To understand why we might be seeing them, we kind of have to figure out why the current junglers have been so dominant. Well, generally speaking, they do all the things. Dueling, early ganks, high damage, they have vision control, and they have huge amounts of mobility. Typically speaking, if you can't bring a jungler that competes across all these areas, you will get crushed in that area and it's not enough to be able to compete. But what has changed? What could potentially compete with this now? Well, there's some big jungle changes. Cinder Hulk is the biggest of them all. Mini Sunfire Cape and 25% bonus health increase to make them absurdly tanky as well as damaging. To add to the damage, the Gromp buff now scales off of bonus health, which can be two or 300 damage from the Gromp buff in the late game and the early jungle where tank junglers struggled the most has been made slightly easier by having less damage coming out of the jungle camps. Razorbeak and Gromp even a little bit have been reduced in damage. So let's take a look at the tank junglers now that might be entering the playing field. So Juani had already entered the playing field and you can kind of see why. She was able to compete across most of the areas that the old set of junglers were able to do as well as bringing absurd team fight. These other guys, struggle a bit more in those areas, but because of the incredible bonus health, the extra damage, the gromp poison, they may be able to compete in the late game. The only thing teams will have to keep in mind if they decide to bring one of these tank junglers is how do they compete and compensate for not working with early ganks, dueling, high damage, vision control, whatever they're lacking, because they're making it up in other areas. I'm really interested to see it. And that's going to be it for this League of Learning. Let's send it over to Freak, who has turned to Twitter for your adoration. Thank you very much, Jack. Call me Draven, because adoration is basically my passive. Thank you for cashing in and being with so much gold fans. Anyway, speaking of Twitter, two weeks ago, we asked you to tweet us and tell us which jungler will master the change of the 5.4 patch and come away with the highest cumulative KDA. The correct answer was Team Impulse's Rush, who pulled in a 15.5 KDA, making him the king of the jungle that patch and making one of you the newest member of the PTL Hall of Fame. Primetime Stathawk, WLZ, and ZLW guessed Rush and nailed his KDA within 0.5, which beat even my strict requirements. That is pretty impressive after all. It was impressive enough to put us in, sorry, to put you into the Hall of Fame. We dropped the velvet rope for you. Welcome. Now, of course, that allows you to rub elbows with all the other inductees into the Hall of Fame, like Lustboy, who continues to remind us why he's taken up permanent residence inside the Hall. Lustboy, we do indeed worship your tweeting skills, or after your dominance at the IEM Championship, the Lulu God. I actually asked you about your Lulu play back in 2012, and you asked to be called Lust Lulu, so that's what I'm going to be calling you from now on. Congratulations on your new title. And in fact, people in Poland adore his skills so much, it looks like they opened a super classy cafe in his honor. Now, if only he could sp uh, speak Polish, he could actually order off the menu. And now, if you guys at home want to join Lust Boy and WLZ and ZLW in the Primetime League Hall of Fame with 140 characters or less, try your hand at this week's Twitter question. 
we're back at the jungle, and in honor of patch 5.5, we want to know which jungle champion will be played the most in the LCS, and what will their win-loss record be? As always, that's across all 20 games in the EU and NA LCS this week. Send your answers, like Urgot, 7 wins, 2 losses, to at LOL Esports with the hashtag PTL. If you manage to guess the correct champion, you win! But if you guess the correct champion and nail their win-loss record exactly, then you can join the very exclusive crowd in our Hall of Virtual Infamy. So while you get tweeting, I'm going to say Woman Zauba and send it over to Jat and Riv, who will take us to China. Oh, that's great. He thinks he's bilingual and funny now. Whew. Got him. Damn. But for now, we'll follow his lead, unfortunately. And check out the scene in China's LPL, the only major region who didn't take a week off for IEM. We start our highlights with Name finally making his debut with Starhorn Royal Club as they faced off against Gamti. Yeah, I mean, this was the return of Name, as you say, and it starts off with the death, unfortunately. He was up 16 CS, though, when this happened. Going a little hard. Thought they had that level advantage, but the six comes in quick for tail here, and they're able to clean up what they can, but just on the outside. You know who else level six came in fast for? Rengar! Ooh! Insect flies in. This was Starhorn Royal Club keeping Name in the game as they stretched it later and later because he was dying a lot. He was getting hit. They had pretty much a list out and his name was at the top to get killed over and over again. Fights once again here. Starhorn trying to get back into the game. 45 minutes in was Name's chance. Yeah, he'd farmed up. He had the huge items on Jinx, keeping that rocket form for the long, long range and the tanks the damage that Starhorn had throughout it was able to close down. He gets excited, they get a bunch of Woo. kills, and they take that game. Just about what they needed to pull themselves back in, and the victory comes in swiftly after that. But game two wasn't any different. It was Focus Name right off the bat. Yep, the teleport down into his lane. <laughs> Just get out of his lane! He wants to farm in peace. This time he was down zero kills to two deaths at the start of that one. Really struggling to get back in that laning yep. phase. But you could tell throughout this whole set, Name didn't oh. know how to play League of Legends in the team fights. The mid game was really tricky. They were using quite a bit to get to him still. Oh, yeah. So it definitely gave the team chances to get around, do what they wanted. Familiar face there as well, and godlike. Yeah, Ackerman, as some of the North American fans yep. will know him, Absolutely. but originally godlike. Like, and geez, Name just can't catch a break <laughs> early on in this game. Yeah, Hui on Jarvan was big. You would think that this game would be over with how much Name is getting crushed down, nope. but Gamchi just couldn't close it out. Name hits his item points and he just starts killing. They knew what they had to do. They stuck with that. They got to the late game and Name once again gets excited to help bring the team back in here. Had to be carried a little bit through the early game, but if you do what you need to get the win, I guess that's all that matters. Yeah, I mean, now that he's at, you can see on the bottom left, all of his items, yep. almost max level as well. No one can get to him <laughs> with the Janna protection. He is the one who ends up finishing this game for World Club. And just brute forcing in the end, Stonehorn World Club playing the composition to a T, and Name having a pretty good debut after being set back quite hard in the laning phases. Absolutely, Name. He has won three LPL splits Absolutely. in a row. Absolutely. Can't take it's that away It's tricky to do it this time, coming in on a near the bottom place team in Starhorn Royal Club, but he's going to try. That's right. Next up was a battle between two of the top teams in the LPL as OMG and Snake went head to head in their fight for the playoff positioning at the top of the standings. Who was going to take it? I mean, we, last time we talked with Pacer Time, we were saying, don't give Baka Zareth. There's a reason oh, for that. Even though OMG started off so well with kills in the top lane right there onto the Leona, it was short lived because Zareth is in town. Zareth is indeed in town. Uzi and the team trying to get the kills they need. A great Oof. heal by Beast there to turn that around as Lovelink dives too far. And this is where Baka just starts to charge up. So much lockdown for Kalista and long range. Kalista oh, can't really dance. kite that well oh. if she's not auto attacking anything. Uzi goes down again to Baka. You just cannot give Baka Zareth. Baka got inside the head of Uzi and the rest of the team here with another snipe. Takes oh. two down. Just with one hit there, you could not get away from this guy. Absolutely not. Snake taking game one very easily. But then Uzi, he meditated or something. He, he just meditated. Sat there. Management came on stage. He was not enjoying the situation, but he regrouped and he came out with this game in game two. Yeah, I mean, I said you can't give Baka Zareth. You can't let Uzi focus that well either because he went 
off this game. What do you do against a guy when he is as angry and motivated as Uzi? Look at this game. He is everywhere and on the map. It's like he has a TF ultimate to just be wherever he needs to. 30 to 13, 18 of those are his. Wait, I'm sorry, 19. It keeps going. And it's a 42 minute matchup. I think they kept that one going long so he could just keep racking. Yeah, I mean, he wanted to keep going. He just probably wanted to kill everybody. <laughs> 30 kills could have been possible for Uzi in that game if they kept it going. Why wouldn't you want to? And as they head into the final three weeks of their spring split, here are the standings in the LPL. Edward Gaming continues to rule the top of the table with a four point lead over OMG. And after their series split with OMG, Snake remains in third with LGG rounding out the top four. And now for a closer look at China's Premier League, let's bring in the man who calls the LPL action from down under. How's it going, Pace Your Time? It's awesome, Riff. How are you? Not doing too bad. First up, we obviously we have to talk about who Team WE surprising everybody at IEM. You were just as shocked as us. You know, how do you think they did it? How did they take everyone down? Not I mean, to be honest, World Elite were actually playing pretty well with their old roster before moving to IEM, but obviously not doing so well. Suddenly, a couple new players, whole new team. So now that they've had that performance at IEM, how do you think they're going to translate that back into the LPL? I think the biggest thing there is that Spirit, who's always been a strong player and looked really good even in China, uh, is just an absolute monster when he's going off. So the rest of his teammates definitely stepping up. Xie looks like a very strong player. Mystic sort of gelling with the team as well. Like, Waterly were already on an upward trend. So it's just a matter of taking the best bits of what they did at IEM, namely Spirit's pressure, and then converting that into more wins for the team. Because they've already looked quite good in China. All right, and finally, we saw Name's debut on Starhorn Royal Club. What was your verdict on his play coming out for the first time? Well, everyone sort of wondered, like, which Name would we see? Is he going to be super aggressive? Is he going to play late game? And he was just going back to late game carries, getting six items and killing everyone. Yeah, I mean, also his teammate, Godlike, or Ackerman, he kind of lived up to his name last week. How big of their success was actually attributed to Godlike as opposed to Name? I think, interestingly, Godlike is capable of much heavier carry performances. He played very consistently, actually played a lot of Maokai, so not massive lane bullies. Um, Name is still a great player. All of Royal actually came together to play around him, and that includes Godlike's very consistent performances. But if they keep using the foundation they have, they'll actually just become a very threatening team, because Godlike will start to you know, carry a bit harder from the top lane as well. Interesting. All right. And we see that Royal Club isn't the only team that's kind of been tweaking their lineup. OMG has been also doing this with a San at the AD carry position. What's your take on this? Yeah, it's actually the whole bottom line. So San's been coming out along with Shi Young, and Cloud from Worlds has actually been back with Uzi. Yeah, and Uzi got 19 kills <laughs> in the final game that he played last week. Is it going to stop since Uzi's kind of been able to pick up the performance, or do you continue to think it's going to keep happening? I think they'll keep doing it just to kind of give Sun the experience in case they want the option. But for me, it was kind of like they brought Sun back in because he plays a lot uh, with a lot less resources than Uzi did. And then Uzi sort of came back and started playing more of that style, but still, you know, just a much stronger, more mechanically gifted player. So they might keep mixing it up, but at the end of the day, Uzi should be the, the last carry in their roster. I should hope so. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Pastry Time. As always, a huge thank you, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Cheers. Thanks, you too. Yeah, and then fresh out of culture sensitivity for training, let us send it to Freak as we check on Primetime League's Fantasy League of Legends Legendary League. Shisha, everybody. So it turns out that I was continuing to feel generous. It seems like it knows no bounds here last week in the PTL FL4. I handed a victory over to Chris Cluey and his team teaming Teemos because honestly, I could never bring myself to defeat Teemo. He's just too perfect. And you are a beautiful sparkle pony, Chris. So don't forget about this win. You owe me one. Now, with only two weeks remaining in this fantasy split, I've set myself up perfectly to come back, tie for first, and then win outright through total fantasy points. Go me! Now, of course, Snoopy did manage to take down Xpeke in the league's last week of competition, and apparently he's now calling himself Maverick, but that's okay, he's used to being a wingman. And son, your ego is writing checks, your body can't cash. Now, we asked you guys to tweet in who would win, and 57% of you actually got it wrong and picked Xpeke over Snoopy. I'm ashamed of you guys, but it's okay. I'm expecting you to step up your game this week as I'm the featured matchup taken on Shocks. Now, Europe won the regional vote, I won the pun offers a quick shot, and of course, TSM, USA, 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 one IEM. This is a no-holds-barred match to prove once again that NA is greater than EU once and for all. 
or at least until next week when we do the whole shtick over again. And I hope that I can at least get some credit for allowing both Shox and Chris to tie me in this rankings and bask in my presence. Hope they really enjoy the view as I pull away to victory this week. So tweet hashtag FreakWin to show your support for the winner, or you can waste your time and tweet hashtag ShocksWin, but don't even bother doing that. So while you guys are spamming Twitter with hashtag FreakWin one more time, let's send it over to Jat, who's back to improve your own fantasy game. Freak, aren't you on a three-game losing streak? All part of the plan, Jat. You, you can't trash talk people if you're up or down in the fantasy league three losses in a row. Just hashtag ShocksWin if you follow trends. And you want to shut that guy up eventually. Oh, well. We got to do fantasy LCS. Let's take a look at the top performance from the last time we were in. Bjergsen, his first time making it into the top 10 all spring, finally paying off for those guys who picked him early. And then the entire Team Impulse team was in the top 10. Apollo, Rush, the two tops on Team Impulse, big time performers. Of course, we had some duds as well. We have Quas. Everyone was talking about his giant champion pool. Unfortunately, it didn't result in many fantasy points as Team Liquid took a bit of a dive back to earth in that last week of the LCS. Yellowstar and Shook, two other players who are superstars in their own right, but underperformers in the fantasy department. We also have yet more alerts. These ones are a little bit strange. Impaler is out. WT Heaven is in as well as Sheep being out and Con Quan replacing him. I don't recommend starting these new players to coast, but if you have either Impaler or Sheep still in your lineup, be knowledgeable that they are no longer starting for Team Coast. And then other news, Winter Fox's experiment with Alltech has support is over. Alltech is back at 80 carry. Glebe is back in the LCS. And these guys actually performed pretty well the last time they were an 80 carry support duo in the LCS. So they might be worth a start in your team. We also have to look at the sleepers or at this point, just people with good matchups. This one is very matchup based. You look at Team Impulse, they're coming off a huge week. They're playing two underperforming teams, Coast and Winter Fox. They should be in for some big points. And H2K, despite that eight game winning streak, not many people are starting Lulex, only 18% of you. They play Meet Your Makers and Elements. Based on the standings, should be easy matchups for them. So expect some big points out of Lulex and the rest of H2K. So that does it for me. And while you play with your fantasy lineup and do better than Freak, we'll plug into the pros and listen to the teams. It is time for Mic Check. Ho, everybody, let's go! Thanks, fans. Thanks, fans. Come Nice fans, by the way. Everyone is Hunis fan. Whatever, I'm 90%. Only for Huni. Fnatic is Huni. <laughs> <laughs> Fnatic is sponsored by Huni. We should we should re rename the team to Huni instead of Fnatic. Yes. Oh, there's Ward somewhere, I think. Ah! Nice. We, can come, we can try, we can try, come, come, come. I had a dream I was using Bjergsen's account and he had a page that had 40 magic pen on it. It appears Cop's going with an interesting strategy here. He's drawing Bulldogs and He hunts. has brought up paint. What right, will he do next? He's drawing... It looks like he's making a game plan. Actually, it's oh, just a dog. It's a dog. <laughs> he is drawing a dog. Everybody restart. Restart? I'm gonna lose my yep. plug drawing. <laughs> Cabo, let's go with me first. Or I don't know, someone. Yeah, give me Lente. What? Dude, I'm not trash. Her? If we 2 out, we go Universal and Disney. What? No, I don't like that. I like you go, go. You have to go. You have I to like go. No. I don't like to go too. <laughs> if I want to go, we all go. We all go. Yeah, yeah. This we is a go. chair. Hey, this is a team. Together. together. Everybody don't die. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who die? Who pay, pay, pay first dinner. die? First die. Fogo. Okay. Fogo. <laughs> first hey, go time. everyone. And okay, so. Okay. Just kidding. Okay, okay, just kidding. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. We'll oh, go, oh. go, 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 Dragon, 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 yeah, the wins. Young Buck in the quarter. Yeah. I mean, he was done after the Zanias, so. Young Buck's player cam. 
Shally Shao and Hooney were the highlights of that one for me. So fantastic. I love how vocal they are. are. So now it is time for PTL to come full circle and bring things back to the victorious North American shores and the current NALCS standings. TSM, CLG, Cloud9, and Impulse occupy the top four spots with one game separating each team from the one below. And then there's that three-way tie in the middle of the table between Team Liquid, Team 8, and Gravity. And with only four games remaining, the fight for the final two playoff spots should be a fun one to watch. That's right. And out of those three teams, which do you think have the best chance at earning places in the postseason? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to say, but I want to look at the upcoming schedules here for these teams. Team Liquid definitely has the best lineup despite a 1-3 and three record against those teams. It's a little bit odd here. They'll be facing Coast, Winter Fox, and Dignitas, which you would think would lead to some victories despite that 1-3 and three record. You look at Team 8, they have a slightly tougher schedule they mm -hmm. face Cloud9 and CLG to name a few, but teammate also face Winter Fox, which should be a win for them if you look at the current standings. While Gravity seems to be in a good spot record rise against the teams they face, if you look at their upcoming games, it may paint a different picture. They face Cloud9 and TSM, both of which should be very difficult matches. It may come down to their final match, which will be against teammate to decide that final spot. All right, so let's climb back to the top of the table where TSM and CLG are both in control of their own destiny right now. TSM is guaranteed a playoff spot and are closing in on a first round bye. CLG, on the other hand, they need two wins out of the next four games in order to guarantee a playoff appearance. Yeah, and looking ahead at their opponents, TSM actually has a 4-0 record over the teams they will be facing. If they can beat CLG or Cloud9, they should lock up at least a top two finish, but it is still possible that they could fall to third if they lose both of those games, which you would say would be almost as likely as Team WE beating the GE Tigers. But it could happen. CLG, on the other hand, has a 3-1 record against the teams they will face with their only loss coming to TSM yep. in their previous matchups. In addition to TSM, they face a recently surging Team Impulse and a teammate in their final four games. So CLG will need to return to their early split form if they want to remain in that top two spot and get themselves a first round bye. Let's see if they can do it. That brings us to our BF game of the week. It's going to be a rematch between first place team Solo Mid and second place Counter Logic Gaming. Yep, TSM and CLG met previously back in week four, which was definitely our BF game of the week. Then it was the most hyped LCS game of the year, that. and it definitely lived up and dare say exceeded expectations. With their owner's hair on the line, Team Solomid came back from four dragons down and thousands of gold behind in one of the most exciting games in NA LCS history. That's some pretty crazy stuff. Bjergsen in week four, MVP Wild Turtle led the comeback with some incredible plays and will look to repeat that performance this Sunday when Team Solomid and CLG face off with first place on the line. And the coaches can breathe a little bit easier knowing that they won't be seeing a repeat of this PTL pink hair highlight. If you would like to remove the towel, you can do so now. I would love to. Oh, man. Oh, oh yes! Yes! yes. 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 Right. Take a deep breath. Are you ready? No. <laughs> no! What? What? No! This is perfect. Oh, this is a perfect my. vibe. Wow. I don't know. So we up the stakes and put the team hair on the line now? You're just talking crazy, Riv. <laughs> that is just too much pressure. All right, so let's... Let's, let's bring it down. It's time for last week's Edge of Your Seat Plays, or as Pink Shot now calls it, the Pinkta. Punching in at number five, Dyra smashes Shea's dreams as he denies the Ariel. Dyrus is still at the back of this dragon pit. Who are they going to go for? <laughs> <laughs> that was smart Get from Dyrus, keeping Shea away from that one. Bjergsen will come in. These Zonyas will be used for Shea, but that will only delay the inevitable for him. Unreal. At number four, Lust Boy Polymorph's Wild Turtle's death into a double kill. Gifted over, and that bottom lane is dangerous. Wild Turtle will come to an instant wild growth from Lust Boy, but is it enough to save him? It's not now as the binding goes down, but Mystic will actually die here. Lust Boy able to turn that one on its head and may just have the damage to finish off Morgana as well. Can he pull this one off? Chasing in as far as he possibly can. Ooh, and gets the finish, and that'll be a double down bottom for Lust Boy. And hopping in at number three, it's Nar going balls to the wall with a four-man ult. Hunter engage from Yoey Flash from high. Zonia's Maple still with the kill, and what an ult for balls, throwing everyone into the wall there. Nice juicy wall right there. Flash wow. smacked him into it, and that's how you win a team fight.
At number two is a tie was a fish out of water as he faced Let Me's Maokai. Right now, but there are some variants. I mean, it's a tie, let's be real. He can do just about anything in the top lane at this point. Good twisted events there from Let Me to avoid some of the damage, but that auto from the W doing a lot of work, even against the passive, but Let Me trading back and forth. Well, the minions doing a little too much damage to the tie. Gonna move and gets the flash. Last auto, no! Let Me just wrecks him with the Q auto. Awesome stuff. And our number one play this week was Pawn with the Jukes. He's dead. Pawn now trying to dance around this fight. There's a flash ball breaker, but doesn't find a beautiful plays coming through from Pawn as he's dancing around. Does land the chain here as well. Blade Surge not going to be available as another distortion gets him over the wall. Pawn doesn't actually opt to go back towards that distortion as now is going to have that mimic available. Does distort around, kills PYL and saves his own life as the ball breaker comes through. Oh my goodness, Pawn is ridiculous on this champion. Incredible number just one rude play. <laughs> in every conceivable way. He knew exactly what he was doing. Remember that anytime you see a pro play worthy of being on Primetime League, you can send it to us. Yeah, just tweet it over to at LOL Esports along with the hashtag ThePenta, and it may be added to the mix. That's right, and you can catch the North American LCS live with fellow fans by joining one of the upcoming bi-coastal viewing parties. Los Angeles and New York City will play host to events this weekend, and for more information how to find or host your own viewing party, head over to lolesports.com slash VP. And that wraps up the viewing party that we like to call Primetime League. Woo! Just about though, Riv. Thanks to our intrepid investigators here at PTL, we learned how Team Solomid celebrated their victory after the IM Championship, and we'd like to share it with you in our last hit. Team Solomid and the Intel Extreme.